Listeners beware, there is quite a bit of chess squeaking from Nick Spottom in this episode, and also Ben says a lot of racial slurs. But other than that, it's your usual funny boys talking about movies. That's me in the corner. 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 <laughs> That's... <laughs> out of my chair. <laughs> I think I thought I saw you in the corner. Trying key uh, of the corner. And I don't know We're if I'm in the, the corner. corner. Oh no, I saw you in the corner. <laughs> the new the new Neil Cicerica remix of That's Me in the Corner. Thought that I saw in the corner. I'm losing my corner. I can't remember the... Um, it, it's hard to make up the lyrics now because I can't remember the original lyrics yeah. to then modify to be about being in the corner. Because <laughs> all, all, all I can think of is that line. <laughs> Thought that I saw oh. the corner Losing my corner <laughs> It's been a while, hasn't it? So, 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 I'm sorry. No, it's just been a while since we've done one, and we I feel like we open every fucking episode like that now, we just go, oh, it's been a while, but this time it actually has been a while. And then I make the same joke about Stained. Maybe. I don't know. The, but, the, they have a song called It's Been a While. Okay. And it opens up with, it's been... No, that's the Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> We're in September now, it was February, it's been... Eight months since you looked at me. It's been eight months since you looked at me. Since you listened to me, because it was, this is a, a vocal show. Uh huh. But yeah, it's been since February was the last episode. And I think we we we've been constantly like saying yes, let's do another one, and then we just don't. And the only plans we really have are when we go out. Now we don't really record a lot. Yeah, and um, the mic, the mic, and the stand is heavy. It's difficult to find a power source when you're out and about. And then I've got a new mic now, so we can actually record at my place without you having to lug your shit over. This is true. And the the golden opportunity of me being uh, alone in my house for a month mm -hmm. is probably the best, because one of the other reasons we haven't recorded at your place is because you've got a terrifying new evil dog. I mean, I wouldn't characterize it like that, but you're a <laughs> bitch. And so is your dog. No, no. it's a boy. Um, it has wiener. The only thing I... The only... I've never... I've not heard a single positive thing about this new dog. I've only heard <laughs> that he bites and chews and hates people. You, you know how they say, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all? Yeah. Well, let's stop, talk, let's stop talking about the dog then. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> because it's... There's very but little good saying, to say about the exactly. dog. Exactly. I've only been... That, but that's one of the other reasons why we've not recorded at yours. But well, now that I've got yeah. a new mic, we can we can do stuff here. He's noisy. He doesn't really respond well to, um... He doesn't really respect anything. people. I, that's... Yeah, you, usually, yeah, well, whenever... Because uh, I think the only times I've, I've, I've seen Dylan show us pictures of the dog is, is when his arm is in its mouth. Well, that's that. Yeah. You know, that, that's just poor decision making on his part. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, you know, he's not a particularly aggressive dog, but I mean, the, uh, we we seem there seems to be something in the water where we live that uh, promotes people to stick their hands in the mouths of canines and then complain when it bites them. Yeah, I don't know. We've got some kind of you know perpetual victim culture we've in our got, house. Got water people in your neighborhood. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Um, people mutated by the water. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what has happened oh, since since we last spoke to our wonderful temporary nieces and nephews? We've watched about seven and a half hours of Telugu films. Yes, we've watched uh, <laughs> three films of SS Rajamouli. The the most popular at the moment, of course, being RRR that everyone was talking about half a year ago. Yeah, um, and we watched in like May, I think. Yeah, not not that I'm against international cinema or anything, but I don't come across a lot of Indian films in yeah. my travels. And the fact that people started to talk about this film and it made me think, oh, maybe maybe it's yeah. got something for everyone. Yeah, I, you know, well, they show Star Wars in China, so why not watch you know a, a big a big Indian film if people like it? Yeah, and um, 
but yeah, all, everyone was talking about it, not just you know Indian Twitter or whatever. Like everyone was talking about not just R-R-R. the Desi sphere. Yeah, not just the you know Indians. Like you had Americans and you had people from all over saying that this movie was fucking awesome. Yeah, by everyone we mean white people talking. <laughs> Shut up. No, it, it, well that's that's that, that's what it is because I mean you know there, there there may be films that are entirely culturally bound that may be big to a particular group of people, but if it's so big that people from other cultures are talking about it, that's notable. Yeah, and then so RRR was one of those, and I think. At one point we were saying, oh, let's go see it at the cinema, and that it was only in the cinema for like two weeks. Where so was we, it playing? It would have been playing at Village for a bit. Really? Yeah. And I think we, I said, let's go see it at Jam Factory. But yeah, let's, enough about like people talking about the movie, let us talk about the movie, because... Why were people talking about it? Because like, what, it was what, awesome. But like, I suppose that like, I, I have a an idea about what an Indian film is like, and what, like, a Bollywood or a Tollywood film yeah. is like. And it was pretty much exactly what I expected. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, why is this film big enough that people got excited, whereas all the other films were, you know, where there's a big hero, and he does the fight, and there's musical numbers, and he wins the girl. Why were those films not talked about, but Ah uh, Ah uh, Ah uh was? I think, well, we're kind of in a weird spot uh, with Western culture, at least, where blockbusters don't feel impactful anymore. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. You, we had... Uh, and this movie, I must say, came out before Top Gun Maverick. Right. So Top Gun Maverick kind of came as a cultural reset for American films, being an actual, you know, great action film. Is it? It is. Oh, it's okay. fantastic. Um, but RRR basically came in a point where, like, we just had all these Marvel movies where it's full of CG, full of special effects that feel weightless and, and there's no conflict or anything. Um, and then RRR comes in on, like, a quarter of the budget of a Marvel film and has these astounding visuals. And, and it's not like you know, some generic Bollywood film where it's just crazy for the sake of being crazy. Mm. This movie is over the top, but it suits the story. Mm. And it, it's, it feels impactful. Like, the special effects have a weight to it. And it's just... It, yeah, the main characters are really likable. Um, Patrick Willems has a really good video where he talks about, like, the, the impact this film had in India. Yeah. And thus... Because it was so big in India, it was kind of inevitable that I guess it would eventually breach out. And with Village, with, with, with you know cinemas like Village, they play a lot of Indian films there, so you'd get a big Indian reception, and thus that kind of leaks out into non-Indian audiences um, hearing about the film as well. Yeah, and I, I suppose that the that the uh, the idea of reversibility seems yeah. almost new in the Anglosphere, where we kind of expect that, alright, if there's a big American film that comes out, then it will play everywhere. It will yeah. play in Bolivia, it will play in Mongolia, people will go see it. You know, The yeah. Sound of Music played everywhere, regardless if it was in, you know, in English or not, or yeah. in, in an English-speaking country or not. But there are very few films that, where it goes the other way. Like, for example, uh, the, what was Parasite. it? Parasite. Like Parasite, okay. I, yeah. I was gonna say, you know, the the one with the where the where the grandma has cancer in China. Oh, the farewell. Um, the farewell. Yeah. Well, the farewell is not exactly the same because it was an American production. Okay. It was a, a like an American Chinese like co-production. You're right, film. and that Parasite is a much better example. Parasite is actually a Korean film and mm. and, and and made in Korea by Koreans for Koreans. Yeah, because Aquafina, the main character in the farewell, is American, is American born. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. Yeah, well. so it, it I, I suppose I, I think that it is inherently interesting as to why certain films are reversible in that yeah. sense, in that they are big in their endemic culture, and then they make it into other ones. Yeah, and I think it's, it's cool that we are getting into that age where films like Parasite and RRR and, like, Portrait of a Lady on Fire and, and, and other, like, foreign films... Are becoming big, but not just to art house snobs or whatever. Sure, because there's this, and I think something that I've noticed a lot is there's this kind of um, elitism that some people portray to people who watch foreign films. Yeah, there's like, 
oh, you watch foreign films, therefore you must be some sort of mo- movie snob or whatever, mm. which is in of itself kind of racist to equate foreign cinema with art house bougie um, snobs when, you know, India makes rom-coms, Japan makes B-horror movies, you know, everywhere makes the same kinds of movies. There are snobby art house films made in America as well. Yeah, so, well, I, I think it's yeah. about effort. I think, for example, if, if, you were to, if you were to take it that, uh, if you're a beer drinker, yeah, if you like VB, it's like, well, if you go to any pub, there will be VB. You go to any bottle of, there will be VB. But if you're like, yeah, well, I'm trying this, uh, this, uh, this, this small batch chocolate stout from Brunswick. And it's like, well, you, you can't just walk into any building and have it. Yeah. You had to seek it out and it's probably weird and it might taste funny. So if you're looking for it and you like that kind of thing, uh, which is, you know, inherently obscure then you're probably some kind of aficionado. So with foreign films, there are some that cross over and are big anyway. Yeah. And But then if it's, uh, if it's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm seeing this film uh, uh, with Jean de Jardin in it. Oh yeah, what's it called? It's called blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Great. Where is it playing? Oh, there's this one cinema in, in Carlton that plays it and it will play it for two days. Okay. You're probably really into film. Yeah. So there is that. There I is that. I expect that, that you're a film wanker if that's what you're watching. There is that, but there's 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 an inherent lack of effort in the other party as well to not seek out films from other countries. Well, of course. Well, they're because, not. Well, not, not, they're not as available. But I'm also talking about things because Netflix uh, actually does a very good job um, at giving because Netflix is a global thing. It's not just American at this point. So mm-hmm. they have industries in other countries and so they're able to get k-dramas and and chinese films and indian films and heaps of stuff from all over the globe to be able to watch in your home in america well that's how people got squid game isn't it exactly yeah squid game was made by netflix or at least distributed by netflix and not just a random show that netflix decided to put on their thing it it had the netflix brand on it Mm. Um, Mm. So Squid Game is an excellent example that I was going to bring up because of the fact that it became the number one show on Netflix for like a month, Um, which is just, it's crazy that Mm. that was actually, it's awesome that that's able to happen now, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, well, certain, certain foreign cultures, and I mean, you know, foreign, depending on where you're from, will become the nouveau for a minute. I mean, you know, Australia was attractive for, you know, for a little bit in the 80s to yeah. the rest of the Anglosphere. And, I mean, you know, in the 60s, people really liked the French and French cinema. And so, and we've had a lot and, of culture and, and, coming out of Korea. And Kurosawa last... was pretty big in America as well after Seven Samurai came out. Sure, yeah. I mean, there was, yeah, a big uh, martial arts fucking... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chinese films were... Chinese films and samurai films were, were ubiquitous with cowboy films for a while. You'd get... Um, You'd get like a lot of people just watching these films on TV or whatever when they would they would show in like the sixties. Because I suppose it's a, it, it's a, a vi- it's a, a variation on the the big dumb action film. Yeah, of yeah, the time. yeah. You got you got your western. You got you got your and then kung fu. out of nowhere, fail. I would say within the last maybe thirty years, they kind of just became this this anti intellectualism, anti foreign film kind of. Oh, I don't want I don't watch subtitles kind of uh, thing that that just kind of became bigger. It became more cool to not watch foreign films than to just ignore them. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You're not as active on social media as I am. No. And I've noticed and this isn't just specifically about foreign films, but in intellectualism in general, there's this just kind of weird wave of people being oh, the curtains don't mean anything, they're just blue, you know what I mean? As as in that that kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, That kind of thing, but taken to an extreme. There's obviously a level of, oh, if the artist doesn't think that there's a meaning behind it, then whatever. But a lot of people going against the idea of there being meaning to something, rather than Mm. just letting it be its thing. They're going, oh, no, that is that there's nothing else to it like a hyper literalism hyper literalism yeah there is there is no symbolism it's all it's just what it is and then that to the extreme of the fact that they won't watch anything that isn't made in america or isn't made by marvel or disney or whatever Mm. this level of anti-intellectualism and there's this this trend of of berating people or film lovers who watch 
foreign cinema or artsy cinema or movies that are longer than two and a half hours or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that kind of, I feel like a, a part of that was kicked off by Zack Snyder's Justice League being in 4.3 and being four, four hours long. Mm. But the film, the people who saw, like, The Irishman in cinemas are considered um, film bros, which is a definition that has changed. Yes, we saw The Irishman in cinemas. We did. Yeah. And then but, we watched it at home. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it just having seen a movie in cinemas apparently uh, makes you this artsy snob when it was available f- in several cinemas to be watched for an entire month. Yeah. Several times a day. It's not like it was made this weird art house release that only mm. one person could see it a day or whatever. But I suppose that any anything that you, that you see as being... Yeah a wave or a movement, I think that all of that is being extra stratified and extra subcultural. Because we... we oh yeah, because it, it's, advent... it's definitely... The, the, it is definitely a subculture of TikTok yeah, and well, Twitter. With the advent it's of it's the not internet, like a widespread thing or whatever. Everyone's yeah. got, their, got their own group. So yeah. there, there's not going to be any kind of monolithic anti-intellectualism, but there may be, you know, a, gr- a large enough group. And But then what you can decide to do is just occupy different spaces. And yeah, you don't yeah. have to deal with that. Yeah. Well, because of the fact that I am of the the group of people who go and see art house films and foreign films and stuff, that stuff is inevitably going to cross my path on the internet. Sure. The stuff that is anti what I stand for. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, in and of itself, the, the, the idea that Disney films are the most successful because of the Disney brand and not because of the filmmakers behind them. Is, is is a similar kind of 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 what's the word um not a uh, lack of effort of trying to see films that aren't made by that st- that aren't made in that style by those people you know what i mean like people aren't going to go see the new lion king because it's made by the guy who made moonlight they're going and seeing it because it's the new lion king yeah yeah whereas people went and saw um fucking Terminator 2 because it was James Cameron. They went and saw Avatar because it was James Cameron. They went and mm. saw Titanic because it was James Cameron. Yeah, of course. Well, the, the difference being that a lot of pe- a lot of people had seen James Cameron's work. Exactly. But knew people, it, loved it, and wanted to Moonlight see Moonlight won Best Picture and no one gives a shit. Yeah, it doesn't... Yeah, but if people but I'm didn't saying, see it, then they won't care. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying that, like, the... Uh, like, there's, there's two levels of caring about the Oscars... Or, or, or awards in general because mm. there's that whole oh awards don't mean that I kind of subscribe to awards don't really mean anything if the film itself is not good mm. but even if the film is good awards give it an extra level of mainstream praise yeah um, because yeah, yeah. there, there's going to be the inside baseball perspective of the people that are filmmakers and care about the politics of it and you know they see their their co-workers and their colleagues getting praised or ridiculed etc and they care about film as an art or as a business yeah and then there's the consumers yeah who are going to be a step removed from it or the casual consumer and they might hear about who wins and if it's a film they recognize then they go great uh or or maybe if they hear that a film won half the time they don't care and then the one time they do care is when a foreign film wins so that they can get angry that they have to watch a film with subtitles even though no one made them but um I mean, no one has complained to me about a film having subtitles before. I, I imagine that's just something you see in your travels. Yeah, yeah. Or may, maybe, maybe it's a completely fabricated thing. Maybe people have an idea about oh, the kind I... of person who would complain about subtitles, and they imagine that they exist. No, I saw a lot of that. When Parasite won Best Picture, I saw a lot of these, like, um basement dwelling youtube movie reviewers who were just anti the idea of a film that isn't in english winning best picture there were a lot of them and they got you know their fair share of views so it's not like some bubble Mm. it's a group of and i'm sure they're not even you know what a a coordinated group just a group that happened to be anti foreign film not not calling them racist or whatever yeah. they're just against the idea of having to read yeah uh while they watch a movie my dad does that my dad fucking hates subtitles mm. i keep trying to get him to watch foreign films but as soon as he hears the word subtitles he said he he 
doesn't want to. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure the reason he doesn't want to watch Shang-Chi, which is a Marvel movie... Is because it's got a foreign name. <laughs> is because it's called Shang-Chi, and there's the idea that it might have subtitles, even though I've told him the movie's in English. Yeah, oh, which okay. is a lie, because there's a lot of Chinese dialogue in the film. <laughs> but, um... Yeah. I think it depends what you want out of a movie. I mean, if if you are someone who who expends effort, who who travels far afield to see whatever, who wants to see things that aren't, you know, the big release, then anything that's going to be potentially a good experience, a new idea, you'll go on your watch it. So you don't mind to read if it gives you the opportunity to get a slice of another filmic culture that you wouldn't have access to. But then there are some people who want a film or another form of entertainment to switch off completely. But So if they have to read, that is yeah. it, that is not allowing them to switch off completely. They have to pay attention to but there's this, whatever the there's, film is. Yeah, it's just this weird... Yeah, the subtitles specifically, are, it's like you're expending the tiniest effort ever to just read that little inch of words on the screen. It doesn't matter, it's the principle. But you can still be watching brainless action movies despite them being in another language, you know? It's, it's, it's the principle, I think. It's the, 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 they, they, uh, that some people may dislike the idea that that is required of them at any point. Yeah. That that is contrary to what they want out of a film experience or an entertainment experience. Yeah, and it's stupid. <laughs> I, 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 I just think... I know I, I, I agree that at some points it is worth just turning your brain off and watching a dumb action movie. I yeah. did it the other day. I watched Time Cop. But um, I, I, I don't understand the idea of not wanting artistic stimulation at least some points in your life. On a weekend when you're not working. Like, just, mm. just watch a movie... On Netflix, not having to go to the cinema to watch some artsy fartsy Korean film, go on Netflix and pick up a fucking action movie that doesn't have a white man as the lead. You know, mm. I suppose it, it depends on, on what role film fills for you. I mean, there, there are going to be people. Do, they do the same with TV. There's yeah. plenty of television that 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 fills the same role. Yeah, yeah. So maybe they'll just they'll use TV for that. In fact, I've I've noticed actually. Um, the trend against subtitles is less towards uh, people who watch television. There's a lot of Korean dramas that are just popular with mainstream audiences, regardless of the fact that they have to read subtitles. I, I know people that, that treat television as just a piece of entertainment, rather than artistic stimulants, who watch Korean soap operas. I suppose that that might depend on... Um what format they're getting it in. I was, I mean, if it was something... Through Netflix. Yeah, or the, yeah, exactly. If it was... If this was 15 years ago, before yeah. streaming was big, yeah, and yeah, TV yeah. was on the TV, then I think that there would be a difference. If, oh, yeah, if, if someone's yeah. like, okay, you can either watch this SBS program, which is in a foreign language, or you can watch fucking Channel 7 and watch, you know, it's a knockout. Whoa. Yeah, they yeah. would go, oh yeah, it's a knockout every time. But I think that... People who... Now that they've been given the choice... The way that people tend to consume TV now, as so a TV in, in, in inverted shows. commas... Shows. Yeah, shows. Yeah. Is in, it, it is, is in the, the binged, serialised format. So you're yeah. only going to watch something if you're invested. Yeah. So if something is, is going to have a good story, and you go, oh, you've got to watch this, it's, it's a good drama, you'll like the characters, you'll be invested in the plot... Yeah. You know, then they'll then they'll bother to read the subtitles. Whereas yeah. I don't think people are tending to watch shows in that in the manner where they just stick shit on and it could be anything. Oh no, no. People people treat T V the same that same way. They'll pop it on in the background while they do something else. Hmm. And often um if if that is what they choose, maybe they won't watch something where they can't understand. What's... Yeah, they wouldn't put on something foreign. They would but, put on something domestic. But the people who still they you know, they'll sit down and watch it. But it's still only entertainment rather than mm. some sort of, you know, yeah. brain stimulizing, fucking stimulizing stimulant, whatever. Um, just sticking it on as entertainment rather than some artistic endeavor. Yeah, but what I imagine is that yeah. the people who are watching foreign content where they have to read subtitles are probably those that care about it in an artistic sense and want to watch, or lots at least, of it. or at least care about 
care enough about it to the degree that they, they will read. Yeah. May, they, they might not care or know that they care about it in an artistic sense. They only care about the characters yeah. or the plot or whatever. Yeah. Which is still at surface level, but it still counts. Yeah, they're watching it because there is something about the content that is meaningful, you know, stimulating to them that, you know... Yeah. That warms their cockles rather than just being like pretty lights for a minute. Or, you, know, you, you come, you stumble in after work, you're just like, give me things, just give me stuff, not spreadsheets. Yeah. I can't, just, if I see XL again, I'm gonna lose control. Yeah. That's just, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, what were we talking about before we went on this tangent? RRR. RRR. Uh, very, Arr. very good movie. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a lot of fun with this. I probably will end up watching it again. Um, I do wish Netflix had the Telugu dub. That's something weird about the way that they put Indian films up, is that they just don't have the original dub that the film was made in. Well, they've, they've got Hindi and they've got Tamil, but they they've don't have hi- the original yeah, one. Yeah, they've got Hindi, they've got Tamil, and they also had Mayalalam, or what? Malayalam? Mal- Mal- Malayalam. That's it. Malayalam. They have, uh, India has, like, a lot of different languages, yeah. and um, a lot of those language groups have their own film industries. So Bollywood is just a subset of Indian cinema. Yeah. All Bollywood cinema is Indian cinema, but not all Indian cinema is Bollywood cinema. Yes. Because they have Tollywood, they have Kollywood, uh, they have another Tollywood, because they've got Telugu and they've got Tamil. Oh, jeez. But, um, and, and, like, all their industries are Hollywoods. Yeah. And they've got, I think, like, five. But it's, yeah, it's pretty nuts that, that, it's funny though that, 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 um, to the layman, Bollywood is just the g- general term for Indian cinema when it's only like a subset. And slowly, not even. It, it is the most successful, but is slowly being overtaken by Tollywood. Yes. Yeah, because of films like RRR and ba- Bahubali. Bah- which, Bahubali. Bahubali, the beginning and the conclusion, which we just watched a few days ago. Which we watched because of RRR, because, yeah. we, because we liked it. And we go, well, let's watch this yeah. other guy's stuff. And again, like, we're not watching these as some artsy foreign films, we're watching them as these big blockbusters. Yeah. Which, which they, is what they are. They are, you know, big dumb action musicals, really. Yeah, well, action movies with musical numbers every now and then. Yes. Sprinkled. Although, I would say Bahubali had more musical numbers than RRR did, I think. Do you think? I think so. Uh, uh, spread across, especially when you consider it like a five hour movie or whatever, rather than two, two and a half hour movies. But I think both of them, I think, individually also had more musical numbers than, than RRR. It, it, it may be. RRR, I can only really remember, like, the Natu Natu one, and then also the ending one. The, the right after, like, right before the credits. Yeah. I remember they have, they have like a dance fight where they, yeah, where yeah. they all like... That was they, the Natu Natu one. Yeah, they dance until people fall over. And... Yeah. That, that's, that's the one that, um, is like, became of like a viral dance in India or something. Oh yeah? Yeah. You had people, like... Have people recovered yet? You had people, um, like, doing the dance in the cinema. Like, when that scene was on... Like, I- Indian Indian cinemas mm. were just going... They go crazy for these movies. And I think that's another reason why they're so incredibly successful, is because Indians love cinema to a degree that Western audiences just don't. Like, they will go to these... They will go to these two-and-a-half-hour movies with musical numbers and just completely eat it up, rather than thinking of it as a distraction for the day. Mm. Like, you won't get people sitting on their phones during this cinema experience. It's they a, are cheering... They are cheering, they are mm. dancing along, they're singing, they're having the time of their life when they go see these so movies. People and, not with... just, and not just in India. Like, uh, if you watch Patrick Willem's video about RRR, he went to several different screenings in different cinemas of the film with Indian audiences, and they loved it just as much as they would in India. It, it sounds like they appreciate it with the enthusiasm of a concert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Adam Neely, who, who's a, a, a music youtuber guy yeah he talks about using the word music as a verb like you know the, and the idea that people music differently so i was thinking that in this case this, this may be a, an example of people moving differently oh yeah this is just 
people have a different relationship to this medium where instead yeah. of being oh you go you sit you're quiet you 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 talk about it a little bit later yeah. instead you go to it and you're raucous and you dance around and you 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 mimic them and you yell and you throw shit yeah. i don't know if they do that but it it sounds it, well i can i can use this as a tangent to talk about myth because of the fact that going to a film festival kind of has a different vibe to going to a normal regular cinema doesn't it um, a little bit. I, I suppose that you're more likely to see people clap at the end of the film. Yeah. Um, which I think is only appropriate if if one of the makers of the film is there. I think I think it's just a general standard of film festival culture at this point. Um, obviously it makes sense when you're at Venice or TIFF or whatever... And the director and, and stars are in the audience, and there's a 12 minute standing ovation for the film. Yeah, I, but, I understand um, clapping them, being like, but, um, yeah, I liked your thing. Thank but you. I think in general, it's just like a almost an acknowledgement of the end of the film or whatever, or just acknowledgement that you had a good time, approval of the film, if you will. I feel like they're almost clapping themselves for attending a film festival. They're like, maybe they are. We just watched a film in French. But I am saying that it, it's you, you will notice it at myth and at film festivals you won't notice it you go see bullet train in a regular cinema or, or everything everywhere all at once or whatever yeah which i um i realized since the last episode came out everything everywhere all at once was released which is my favorite movie of the year and we still need to watch it together because it's fucking fantastic i i heard that it's yeah. very good but yeah with myth we saw a few movies at MIF this year. I saw a lot of movies at MIF. You, I think, joined me for three of them? Or two of them? Um, I've got here a list of all the movies that I saw at MIF this year. So I saw The Humans, uh -huh. which was a movie based on a play. It's basically centred around a family uh, gathering for Thanksgiving in the new apartment of the daughter. as yeah. she, She's moved into a new apartment with her boyfriend. And there's just this kind of tension around the family, as there usually is on Thanksgiving. Uh, I think one of the highlights of this film to mention to people is that it features a dramatic performance from Amy Schumer. Oh, okay. And it is good. Oh, a so good she, performance. she's a good actor? She's good in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And actually, like, there's a few moments of her being funny that are funny. Like, she's got good comedic timing when she's not right... When she's not talking about her stinky pussy or I whatever. Saw, I, I saw her talking off the cuff, just, you know, on, on some fucking talk show. And she was really witty. And I could tell that she was yeah. that she was a lot younger. I think she was talking to fucking... Um, it, was, it, it, it looked like Stephen Crowder, but I don't want to say that it was. It, yeah. it was some guy who was, like, espousing the utility of abstinence. And, and she was making some apt but funny points. And I was like, huh. Amy Schumer was funny. Yeah, I think I think she definitely has the ability to be funny. She just often isn't. <laughs> that's 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 my takeaway because okay, that's pretty pretty good coming from us. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of her, you know, stand up just does not hit the marks. It feels like it wants to. I don't think she was, she's ever been funny when she hosts something like yeah. the Oscars or anything like that. It's um, like she's playing a, a caricature of herself, where people have sort of misconstrued what she does, and then she does that. Yeah. I haven't seen the movie Trainwreck. I've heard it's good. I did I did see Trainwreck, and I thought it was it was fine. Yeah. My friend Makar. Have you met, you, you, have you met Makar? Maybe, maybe. Makar is a very conservative gentleman. Okay. Uh, he's a you know, Russian Orthodox. And he says it's the only film that he's walked out of. Really? Yeah. Like, in the cinema? Yeah, he went to see it in cinemas, uh, I, I think, like, for a friend's birthday or something, and he left. Wow. In the middle of it. And I don't, I don't think it's... I don't think I've ever left during a film. It's not outrageous or anything, but maybe it just rubbed in the wrong way. Maybe, but... maybe. I've not... I've never walked out of a film. I've, I've sat through shit movies in the cinemas because I paid my money. I'm sitting through this thing. You know? I've turned things off. Are, are we... Oh, I've... Yeah. I've... Mm, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big movie quitter. I think there's very few movies that I... I can't think of a movie off the top of my head that I have um, turned off because I thought it was bad. Do you eat movie leftovers? Um, what? 
I don't know, like, would you, would you start watching a film and go, oh, I'm, I'm full of movie, and then watch it later? I have done that, because uh, I did that with Zack Snyder's Justice League, because the movie is too long. Because it's split into two discs. Because it's fucking long. So I, so I watched half of it earlier in the day, did other stuff, watched the rest of it later. Then you went and, like, had a life, and then you came back and returned to Zack Snyder's yeah. long-ass film. Yeah, because I was I I had did I did have things on that day that I knew I would be able to watch the first half beforehand and then watch the second half after. Does it does it reheat? But wouldn't well? but wouldn't really have the time to watch the whole thing after or the whole thing before. If you cover it. Zack Snyder in cling film, does he get sweaty in the microwave? Probably. Where are you going with this? What? Such a nothing joke. <laughs> 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 but um you use me I don't care I can't think of any any movies that I've like turned off there's movies that I haven't finished but more often than not they've been out of my hands so we started Forrest Gump in a high school English class which is the stupidest <laughs> idea ever out. because it's fucking two and a half hours long and your English class is an hour yeah and, and this was the last class of the semester, so we couldn't go back and watch the rest. Oh, okay. And since... I haven't since finished Forrest Gump, because it's one of those daunting classic films that, that I just haven't bothered to watch yet. I never watched the second half of Gremlins. I, 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 you okay. haven't seen Gremlins? I never, I never watched the full... Gremlins. You haven't finished Gremlins. Was when I was uh, I was a small child. I think it was on. Oh, was it? Did it scare you? I, th I think I think it was on TV, and so then they started to turn into the Gremlins. Yeah, yeah One yeah. like burst out of it, covered and grabbed someone's hand. Yeah. And I think as a, a, a moron child, I, I just freaked out, and I, I hadn't gone back and watched. The That's film. fair. Well, maybe we should do that for Christmas this year. I would I would like to watch Gremlins. It's a very good movie. Joe Dante is one of my favorite directors. So, so. I hear that the second one is second one is bonkers. excellent. Second one is a fantastic film. If if matinee didn't exist, I think Gremlins would be his magnet. Gremlins two would be his magnum opus. Isn't it like they he just got given a license to print money? He, yeah, basically. Um, like, Warner we, Brothers we loved the first one. No, so go nuts. Warner Brothers uh, wanted him to do two. He yeah. didn't want to do two. Right. He was very anti-sequel. What a fucking position to be in for and a massive so, company to be like, oh, no, can you so do So then it? they, they no. basically went to heaps of other directors. It was in development for like 10 years and then just nothing happened. It was like the Flash movie. They just kept, you know, no one's direction fit with what the studio wanted and vice versa. And the other people would, they would get on, find the task too daunting and then go do something else or whatever. And then they asked Joe Dante again, and he asked for complete creative control. And they said yes, as long as it's called Gremlins 2. That's fantastic. And and he made a fucking wild film. It's s almost an anti... It's, it's, it's actually kind of similar to what happened with the new Matrix film, in that I think uh, Lana Wachowski was basically just given the opportunity to make whatever she wants, as long as it was called The Matrix. And... Uh, and she made a film that is just completely anti-franchise, anti-merchandise, anti-Warner Brothers. And they ate it up. They let it release it as it was, and it's fucking amazing. The, if the movie had better action scenes, it would be a masterpiece. Isn't that of, also of how satire. Freddy Got Fingered happened? Where yeah. They, some, where they yeah. approached Tom yeah. Green and they're like, we don't understand what you do. Here's a blank check. Give us a movie. Yeah. And so he shat that out. Yeah. And just so, because they said, give us, um, or, I don't care what it is, yeah. Freddy give got, us something. I think Freddy Got Fingered works both as just a fun, subversive comedy, but also as a giant middle finger to the film industry. A giant in, g diamond in, in, encrusted with jewels! Jewel, in China with cheese! This is a fancy restaurant. I want to watch Freddy Got Fingered again. That movie is so fucking stupid, I love it. Um, so, after The Humans... I saw Mole Song Final, which is the third film in a trilogy by Takashi Miike, one of my favorite Japanese directors. Mm -hmm. um, those movies are pretty wild. They're these fucking there's these yakuza comedies about a, a stupid police officer who's really bad at his job. Okay. He then gets fi quote unquote fired and promoted to an undercover agent because he's so despicable. He fits right into the yakuza. Right. So they use him as a mole to stop a drug 
uh, uh, operation, basically. Okay. Uh, but but um, in his investigations, he actually forms a genuine bond with his higher up or his brother in the Yakuza uh, like group called Papillon, and they become really good friends. Um, and so he is torn between his duty as a cop and between his love for his brother. Um, but it is also this outrageous sex comedy. It's like Austin Powers times two. That actually sounds quite compelling. They're, they're quite funny. They're very silly. The v- visual effects, especially in the first one, have aged like milk. Okay. Uh, even though it's like only like less than ten years old. But they're very silly and very fun. I've still got uh, the first two on my hard drive, so... Yeah? Yeah. I, I would love for them to do a, uh, an actual release, uh, like a, a Molsong box set or something. I, I would get that immediately. Nick then proceeded to talk about Takashi Miike for too long. Maybe he'll save it for a future video essay or something. Next movie. After that, I saw... Well, I saw... I did three movies in one day. I saw The Black Phone, which was pretty fun, but that wasn't part of Myth. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the vibe of that one. I like Stephen King, so I kind of... This movie was written by his son. Yep. Or short story. Stephen Prince? No. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Hill is his name. Joe Marvel. Fuck. Um, and then after that I saw Vortex, the new Gaspar Noé film. Completely devastating film about um, Alzheimer's. Yeah. And dementia. The movie's done in split screen, mm-hmm. um, with basically both sides of the relationship on each side, and so uh, it, it shows their daily routine as she deals with losing her memories and, and brain power and stuff like that, and he's got a heart problem, so it's a very, very sad movie. I was expecting this movie to be hard-hitting because Gaspar Noé does not pull punches, Mm. But more often than not, the pulled punches are physical. He makes very violent, controversial films as well. This is a very soft-spoken film for him. And yet still incredibly hard-hitting. Um, and then after that, we went and saw Incredible But True together. Incroyable mais vrai. And I think I've been speaking enough. You can talk about Incredible But True. Um, if you remember enough about it. I mean, I, re- I remember it, but I, I, th- there's not a lot that I can say without really spoiling it for the, uh, for what, the viewer. Cause... What's the main conceit of the film? What's the, the concept that is introduced to us in the opening scene? So, there is, um, there is a house. The, this couple, this French couple, are sold a house. And the clincher here is this is no ordinary house. There is a feature in the basement... There was a hole. There was a there was a hole which um, uh, leads into a, a, a tunnel with a ladder that goes straight down. Yeah. And it comes out the ceiling of uh, the upper floor of the house. Yeah. So they go from the basement to the ceiling, and when you go through this tube, through this hole, you advance. I think. 12 hours into the future, yep. and also you become, what is it, three days, three days younger. Yeah. So, you reduce in age, while the world actually increases, mm. and so, and then, you know, funny things happen from there. Yes. Um, the, yeah, this is a couple in, I don't know, they're middle age, mm. so, you know, aging and time is not, uh, a not insignificant question for them yeah um and the b plot is just the dude with his <laughs> I, I i i don't want to yeah i, I don't no? even want to spoil it because it's just it it doesn't even need to be there but it just adds it well, just adds it's, some it's, flavor it just adds zest it does actually still kind of um if anything you can actually and, and like while the movie does feel like it could just be there as a funny comedy, I feel like it also happens to be a pretty pro- profound, if that's a word to use, film about aging and and the things that come from age. So also, one's manhood sometimes becomes less um, active, as it were, when you were young. And so that also fits into the general theme of of aging and and virility and sensuality and stuff 
that isn't really... So I wouldn't call it, um, you know, in, I wouldn't call it inconsequential to the A narrative, but it is definitely far sillier. Sure, it's 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 it, it's it's peripheral in theme. Yeah, and they uh, they they make it come round. Yeah, it doesn't feel completely out of place, and it also is hilarious. So yeah. it, it, it doesn't feel unnecessary. It's very funny. This is very funny. It's very really funny. And so uh, this was from the director of a film that we saw a few myths ago. Yeah. Oh, oh so yeah, this this is also um, uh, Deer Skin. Yeah. Um, uh, Le, Le Dame. Uh, yes, Le Dame. Uh, which was the film, one of two films we saw in Myth 2019, which we talked about in a previous podcast go listen to episode 20 um was um moon age daydream part of myth yes it was okay well, but i um, also saw that that's later on i also happened to see so the day after incredible but true i saw mona lisa and the blood moon which is the new film by anna lily amirpour who is a, a iranian american director yep and this is her third film i really liked her debut i was kind of indifferent uh, on her second film, yep. but I I think I really liked her new one. It's this kind of, it's got this meandering vibe to it. It's, it feels kind of dreamlike, very floaty, um, but yet still has. If it's it's a focus less on narrative and more about characters. So the characters in this film are really fun, um, and you basically get to hang out with them for an hour and a half, an hour forty minutes. Mm. So the main character is this Korean mental patient. Yeah. Who happens to have telekinetic abilities. Uh, she can control people with her mind. So she uses that to escape. And mm -hmm. basically goes on a uh, misadventure through the neon-soaked New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. So it's very uh, uh, sweaty film as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know. Um, but very colourful, very funny. Uh pretty nuts. Craig Robinson's in it. He plays a cop that follows her around. And Ed Screen. I, I really liked his character. Ed Screen plays this kind of at first seemingly scummy kind of drug dealing DJ guy. But, and you think, oh in any other movie this would be the guy who takes advantage of our clueless protagonist. Um, and instead he just turns out to be a genuinely nice guy who finds like a soulmate in, in the main character. And just helps her with whatever she wants. It's pretty cool. It, it's like subversive, you know? Ed Screen, did you know that his birth name was uh, Edgar Cinema? The next film we saw, uh, that I saw, was Something in the Dirt, which was a uh, weird, like, semi mockumentary, semi fictionalized, uh, sci fi mind bending thing from the direct, from two of the directors of Moon Knight. <laughs> Um, and they've done a, f a lot of other really crazy mind-bending films called, uh, The Endless, Resolution, Spring, and Synchronic. Uh, so this is their fifth film that they made on a budget of probably nothing. Two dollars. With the visual effects all done by themselves and, and shit. Um, that's cr pretty crazy. I, I can't, I don't know, I can't really explain what it's about without going in detail about the plot, and I don't really want to, because it's really spoilery. And I, and I don't want to listen anyway, so no, let's talk exactly. about Munich's Daydream instead, because I saw that. Yeah, well, I think after that I saw Tale of King Crab, and then I saw Broker, and then we saw Moon Age Daydream, which now you can talk about. We, we saw, I, I, I saw 95% of Moon Age Daydream. Oh yeah, so you walked in about like five minutes late. I want to say, you, I want to say longer than that. Maybe even, yeah, maybe even ten minutes late, but you actually, you at least still got to see the title card. <laughs> yes yeah because the title card came in about like five fifteen minutes into the film but why were you so late um i i think that i i was worried about setting off too too early because i didn't want to just fucking you know hang around and stand around the cinema so i'm like you know what look i'll, I'll go I'll, I'll go a little later so that way i can get there like fucking 10 minutes beforehand um and it just it just all of the elements had more waiting and took longer than I expected them to. Yeah. So, I and I, I fucking 
hot-footed it from Parliament Station up through the gardens into the thing. And so by the time that I was in the cinemas, I was fucking drenched. I was, you know, it was just sweat and I felt gross uh, and I slumped in my seat, you know, with, you know, feel, I could feel my heartbeat in my temple, you know, and then I watched the rest of the film. Yeah, which was a, almost a sensory overload. <laughs> so would you want to have been in a, a similar kind of fugue state while you're uh, watching a film like this? Um, uh, maybe. I thought, uh, uh, maybe you it's, think maybe you it's would, apt. Well, do you think you would want to watch this film high? Um... Would you go again to watch the first ten minutes of, of the movie and then the rest, like, a second time? I'd probably just watch the whole thing again because yeah. it was good. And yeah. Uh, it, it sounded fantastic. So we, so we saw it at IMAX. Yeah, so not only say, was yeah. it a visual spectacle, the audio was, was incredible. And, and it was huge. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, there's a lot of early footage, you know, from this, you know, the, the Spiders from Mars days. So you know, they're playing live and they've, they've recorded it. And it looks like the camera is, it's someone standing in the front row just sort of pointing it upwards at yeah. David and the band. And so everything is covered in like a like this magenta hue and we're all it, it's a it's a, a, a high angled shot um but it sounds incredible the fidelity yeah. of the audio and um, you know yeah, the, there's good separation i can hear all the instruments really well you know it doesn't sound fucking whooshy swooshy uh it's not like you just get an, an, an undifferentiated wall so yeah. i there, there must have been some kind of remastering treatment, Absolutely. some something that makes it sound extra crisp. But I mean, the, the whole thing was really good because it was soundtracked by David Bowie. Yeah, I think I think because of the, um, I think so with Get Back, I think they definitely put a lot more effort into restoring the video footage than they did the audio footage. The audio sounded great. But the whole thing looked, like, really great the whole time. They did a really good job with um, rest restoring and and upgrading the, the 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 film style of Get Back. Stunning, yeah. Well, I mean, but particularly with, in comparison but, but, to the Let It Be film. But with Moon Age Daydream, I think they did the opposite, where they let the footage be grainy and strange looking but they put a lot of effort into making the audio sound incredible because yeah. a lot there's a lot of footage in moon age daydream and i think it helps the style of the film as well is definitely very different to get back which is much more of a laid back uh fly on the wall kind of documentary whereas moon age daydream is a stream of consciousness this psychedelic uh splattering of david bowie's brain on the screen um, well, it's also important to demonstrate course because I think with, yeah. so with get back it's all it's it's about a month period and it's there the whole time. Whereas so, Moon Age Daydream is his entire life. Yeah, because Moon Age Daydream demonstrates uh, you know development and change. You you start seeing it you know with the the sort of cruddy footage which can only be as good as it can be because of the the age and the lighting conditions etc. Yeah. So then by the time that you're looking at him in you know 1990 on the Conan show or whatever. Yeah it's got to look different because yeah. it's got to show you a different David. And yeah. you can... And I mean, they obviously did enough of a restoration that it would look good on a 4K IMAX screen. I mean, it all looks but good, yeah. but it's, you know, it's about a much of a muchness. It's about, it's oh, yeah. about comparison. And, the, and I think because of the fidelity, you can actually see him age quite a lot. And, I, and, yeah. and David like has always been a, a good-looking guy and he did he did you know live a, a rock and roll lifestyle at times but i i never realized that yeah I, towards the end of his life he did start to show his age mm. and i could only tell that because of how good the film looked and they also used snippets of other films that he'd been in which obviously would have been kept in a much better condition than some of the b-roll and, and archival footage of him from concerts and stuff mm. films like the man who fell to earth mm. or just interviews from conan and dick cavett and stuff like that mm. where it's just high, already high quality enough that it doesn't need too much of a restoration in comparison to the eight millimeter stuff of him uh noodling on his guitar in 1960 whatever 
Yeah, and, uh, and to make another comparison between Moon is Daydream and Get Back, I think... So Get Back is very goal-oriented. They're like, mm. like, hey, fellas, let's make an album. And then they make the album, they play yeah. it on the roof, and the film finishes. Yeah. Moon is Daydream is not that. It doesn't really have so much of a story as it is uh, feeling like watching... Um, if anything, it feels like the vision of a man's entire life before he dies. You know what I mean? When they say, oh, my life flashed before my eyes or whatever. Mm. It's like that for two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. It because does, it's I, very... I, yeah. There's very few moments of stillness in Moon Age Daydream, whereas Get Back is almost exclusively stillness. Yeah, well, I, I'm not really sure about where the film is going or what, or if there is a point that it's trying to make, or if it is just sort of... Hey, we've got a collection of footage. Do you want to see it? Yeah. And then we saw it. Well, it, th there is the the point to it is uh, it's less of just watching Bowie's life and more showing his appreciation for life as he grew older and and how he changed and what lessons you can take from that yourself rather than the film imparting a lesson on you. It's more take from it what you will. The kind of it's it's a impressionistic documentary in that. It's less got a message and more uh, showing you things and letting you take from it what you will, you know. So one person might look at it and see, you know, oh, he led a fantastic creative life. I would love to do something like that. Or other people might think, oh, he uh, led such a crazy over-the-top life. I'm glad that I work in this office or whatever, mm. you know. Or some people, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's been enough of a time since I watched it that I can't exactly remember a lot of the monologues that he had about appreciating life and appreciating the details of life and appreciating the art of everyday life as much as appreciating the creative expression of working in, 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 in art and in music and in all the other different creative endeavours he had. But uh, I basically took from it the the overall positivity he, he gleamed from a life of creative expression. It mm. seemed like he definitely found himself and, and, and led a good life, at least near the end. Uh, he, 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 it was like a journey of self-love, if anything. Learning, learning to love himself through his expression and, and finding new ways to express himself through his art you can chime in whenever you want <laughs> he he seems like he did everything that he ever wanted or set out to do that if, if he had an inkling of an idea if there was a pursuit a project that he did it yeah that the only thing that restricted him was time yes that he probably would have continued to do other stuff. I mean, yeah, I, like I own Black Star and I've listened to it lots, and it's mm. still really good. Uh, so just because he was older didn't mean that he wasn't no exactly doing good work still. Yeah, he, he would have continued to. And I think the idea, I think the best benefit of a film like Moon Age Daydream is not just you know just showing his life, but also because of how he would go about different styles constantly. He'd try new kinds of music, he tried new genres, but also physically he he had all these different personas that he would use to go with those styles of music. Mm. He had all he, he he wore all different kinds of clothes. And he's, he's the the film was showing his evolution from style to style, yeah. both musically and, and, and physically. He didn't have to consider Oh, is this is this the kind of song that David Bowie would write? Because that th there wasn't a lot of consistency there. I mean, yeah. if you listen to even just his first few albums, they're all yeah. pretty different, but and like, then they compare, get different still. Yeah, compare songs from Let's Dance to songs from Black Star, and they sound like from any other artist. They they they, they would come from two completely different bands, but from David Bowie, they just feel one chapter in, in a really varied life. Or two different chapters, I mean. Yeah, oh, I yeah. mean, you don't even have to do that you know, in, com in comparing across decades. I mean, the, the difference between, say, uh, The Man Who Sold the World and Hunky Dory oh, yeah. are, are fairly 
pronounced. Yeah, you know, that you know the one is is a lot more progressive and heavier, and the other one is you know more whimsical and folksy. Yeah, and you know, more about pop radio. Because yeah. I mean, there, there are songs in there that it's like, oh, I didn't realize that David Bowie wrote this fucking you know nine minute progressive rock fucking thing. Yeah. And then, you know, he went and did fucking Blue Eyed Soul, and then he went and, you know, he did electronic stuff, he did, he did weird yeah. shit, and he went, yeah, you know, it, it... Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why I think this film is fantastic, because of the fact that it manages to, I guess, f- seemingly effortlessly, but also completely satisfyingly encapsulate a man's entire life into two and a half hours. I mean, the man was kind of unencumbered by the consistency of personality. And I think because of the film is so eclectic, um, it fits that style perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. The film chose not to have a style, but to have every style. Seamlessly transitions from archival footage to stuff that he made in his bedroom to animation to crazy psychedelic editing, um, uh, concert footage and documentary footage uh, and, and, and interviews and manages to make it all feel like this seamless two and a half hour stream of consciousness that it it never gets boring it never feels like it's not going anywhere but also you never know where it's going to go next and the two films that i watched before it (laughs) were uh a weird italian drama a period piece drama called the tale of king crab and a korean film called broker which is directed by a really talented japanese director called kuro uh, Hirokazu Koreeda, who, after the success of his big film Shoplifters in 2018, has basically said, All right, I've said all. I, it seems like he said all he needed to say in Japan, and he's now just going off and directing films in other countries because he followed that up with a film in France. Oh, yeah. And now his new film is made in Korea. And I like that he did that instead of going and making his English language debut or whatever. I, I would love to see more directors go and do that just make films in other countries because they can rather than just you know foreign filmmakers feeling obliged to come and make a film in america for Mm. success instead he decides he doesn't need that he goes and makes a film in korea with well-known korean actors and and a decent budget to make a really interesting and fantastic drama Mm. Yeah, that is also effortlessly funny. But so it's not just the setting that changes. He goes and he works with, you know, people yeah, in yeah, the yeah. country who, you know, that actors, screenwriters, yeah. etc. So if he made, so when he made his film in France, it was with a French, French film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With in French with French actors. Yeah, yeah. Same. So his Korean film is in Korean with Korean actors, not just a Japanese film that's set in Korea. Uh, I would love to be able to get a career like that where I could. You know, make a bunch of films in Australia, and then instead of feeling obliged to go to America and continue my career there, like every other fucking filmmaker ever, um, I would love to just go and make films in other countries. I'd love to make films in Ireland and films in Japan, films in France or whatever, if I got the chance to. In Ireland, I'd make a film about... I'd make a film about... A lobster. lobster. Um... And that's a whole different tangent that I don't think I have the time for. I think we have just enough time to end with... Come. We're not going to talk about Timeland, I assume. (laughs) It's funny that I've got this, like, list of stuff that we talked about. Instead, we talked about foreign cinema and myth. And come. Uh, No, that's what you like to talk about. I don't particularly care about talking about come. Unlike you. Uh, What? What? Hmm? Well, I guess this is a question that kind of goes, um, it it makes sense that we've got a question like this, kind of matches what we were already talking about. What is love? Kevin asks, what, uh, what's the most surprising watch of 2022 so far? I, I assume surprising mean like a film that you didn't expect to be as good as you. When I went to Costco, there was a, there was, um, a watch that we got for a friend of ours and the watch was called Mr. Daddy. And really? That surprised me. That is a very surprising watch. That's, yeah. I mean, I guess I, I'm often surprised at the amount of different fucking fitness watches that we sell at JB Hi-Fi. There's so many, they all do the same thing, but there's so many, like Garmin has so many different 
kinds of watches that all do the same thing and they're all different prices. Do any of them have big and it's... daddy energy? No. No. None of them do. Well, that's why you've got to go to Costco and get Mr. Daddy. This is a question that I think uh, uh, you're more equipped to answer. Is, is pee what? stored in the balls? Yeah. Yeah? Uh-huh. You're de- definitely going with that. That's your final answer? Lock yes. it in, Eddie. Lock it in my balls where I store my pee. This is fucking stupid. Uh, how many toddlers could you fight before passing out? I think realistically... Oh, toddlers... How old, are we, how old are we talking about toddlers? What constitutes a fight? Yeah... If you, you just, if you just drop punt one, is that a fight? Yeah, because you... I mean, you could very easily kill several toddlers before passing out. Like, with a kick to the face. I could kill thousands of small children without stopping. <laughs> Take that out of context. <laughs> That's the, the context in, in, in... Who could eat more pickles in one go? Do you like pickles? No, I hate pickles. And I have had them. This is not me just... In, you know, going... being. Being like, I don't like this to something that I've never eaten. It's green. Yeah, um, I like a pickle. You, 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 uh, you seem uh, like the kind of guy who, who, who could, who could throw a pickle. Uh huh. You could throw several pickles at once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Do, do, do I strike you as a fairly accommodating fella? Yeah. <laughs> How many pickles do you think you could eat in one go? Are we talking like a pickled cucumber? Yeah, pickle, yeah. Well, I mean, pickle Pickle is a, is, a, is a preservation process. A pickle refers to a pickled cucumber. Not necessarily. A pickle, like the noun pickle. Yeah, like you could... like Not the verb to pickle something. No, you can also buy... Or the buy, adjective that is something that is pickled. You can also buy jars of pickle, which is, you know, which is a, a collection of vegetables. That is a jar of pickle, not a pickle. And if, the things in those... If we are talking about pickled cucumbers, which is what I'm trying to yes, ascertain... and which I already said that is what we are talking about, and what we mean when we refer to a pickle. I mean, that's that's not true, but that may be what is It is the collo- colloquialism that is a pickle. Yeah. Yes. How many pickles do you think you could eat in one go? Like in one sitting? like without In being one sick? sitting, yeah. I mean, if it fucking depended on it, I could probably eat a jar without dying. How many would be in a jar, estimating? I don't know. Many? How big the jar? How, 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 how big the jar? <laughs> how big the jar? I don't know, fucking... The size of your head? Fucking this big? The size of your head. Sure. Okay. I could eat one, one Ben's head of pickle. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. This feels like the end of half of our podcast where we just get very low energy because we've been talking for too long. How, how long have we... Because we've had, we've, had, um, we've had this funny Donald Trump face up the entire time. <laughs> I love long face Trump. Yeah, I, it, the audience doesn't know, but uh, the entire time that we've been recording, this picture of Donald Trump has been up on the screen. Can that be? And like Ben the, has been trying. Background? He's been trying his hardest not to laugh. I will, I'll make. I'll make this picture of Donald Trump your head on the thumbnail. <laughs> no, I, I, I want this to be the background, and then you can put us either side I'll, of I'll Donald ma- Trump. I'll make this very faint, <laughs> so it'll look like a normal white backdrop <laughs> unless you pay attention and you see that his face is there. Like a fucking 90% opacity. What I'll do is, I'll have, for the thumbnail of the video, I'll have it blank. But during the actual video, the picture of Trump will slowly, <laughs> slowly <laughs> fade into existence. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point of the podcast, I think it is at full opacity. Yay. Um. <laughs> so I think... So, I've been curious, why is it that the area around his eyes is so pale compared to the rest of it? And I think... It's because... When you get a tan, when you get a spray tan that you put on, like, goggles for safety... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must just be the bit that's that's covered up, and then the rest of him is orange. It's so... Trump's complexion is so strange, because 
it doesn't look natural for any person ever, and yet, it, were I to see him without the spray tan, it would look like an alien. <laughs> like, 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 I, you can't imagine Donald Trump without the orange skin, and yet, this orange skin is very clearly not his, his normal thing, and he clearly, either, it's, it's permanently like that, and he just has, you know, he, he has like a recoating every now and then. Uh, 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 which is why his eyes are like that. Or he does it every day. It just seems like such an oversight for someone who is so into, like, their image. The thing, the, the, the fact that they would leave that just it's... untouched, it seems, it's, it seems careless. Yeah, it's, well, it's, and then, I mean, it's a, it's really funny to me how he's so obsessed with image and yet everything he's done to maintain image makes him look like a fucking idiot. Because his hair... Does not look like hair. It looks like the bit of like when you when you uh, sweep up dust bunnies and yeah. and you di- and you bleach it. Yeah, yeah. That's what is. It's that does not look like hair half the time. This picture it looks like hair. Um, that looks like hair. What is it? I forgot about the Trump sphere. <laughs> I guess I'll have to put the Trump sphere up on screen right now as well. <laughs> Um, so anyone that is watching on YouTube knows what we're talking about, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, in this picture it looks like hair, but there's so many other pictures of him where it does not look like hair, it just looks like, well, I mean, it looks like hair, but it doesn't look like his hair. You you know, in, in art class, how there would be communal brushes that just everyone would use and abuse, and they would, they would be in paint, they would be in water, and they'd sit around, they'd dry out. Yeah. You know how, like, the texture, it's both... Hard as fucking granite, but it and looks frail soft. as shit. Yeah, that's the kind of texture that it looks like. It looks, it like, looks it's like if been... you if you touched his hair, it would be hard. If, it's like, <laughs> if you if you, it's like a to... solid block of hair. But closer to the scalp, it must just be like, oh, it, it it would just be matted with fucking like brill cream. But then towards the end, it would be brittle. Yeah, like like it it would snap off <laughs> like like a rose that's been dipped in liquid nitrogen. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what I'm imagining. Is it's like matted together. I'm I'm curious now like uh, a waspy to dreadlock. see what Donald Trump. Look at us making Donald Trump jokes in the year of our Lord 2022. Um, yeah, what would he look weird. like? I guess we've kind of strayed away from a lot of Trump talk during this podcast while he, when he was actually president, didn't we? Yeah, because now he's just a funny man. And, uh, oh no, he's still a he's still a th- threat to national security, but uh, it, you know he is also a funny man well, while doing that. Well, okay. uh, true, uh, Donald Trump without tan. <laughs> Someone. Photoshopped it. See that? I guess this one here. It's Chuck McGill. That looks kind of kind of natural. This one is not. That looks like Roger Ebert. <laughs> See, look at that one. That that one there with like the, the like the gradient. No, up. The yeah. gradient. Yeah. So he didn't always look orange. He used. He's to... gotten more and more orange as the years went on. Yeah. He used to look like a person. <laughs> Donald Trump, young. You could feasibly, I mean, where, where... Is that fucking Neil Young somewhere? Where he alive today, you could probably get Dennis Hopper to, to play Donald Trump in a movie. Because they'd, be they'd probably be a similar age if Dennis Hopper were alive. Huh? Yeah, well, there's a fucking... What, what, what's Neil Young with this one? Donald Trump? Why? I don't know. Donald Trump spoke Twitter war with Neil Young, co-seeing a total hypocrite. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they met once... They it's should. not. It's not infeasible to imagine that Donald Trump has met a few celebrities. Infeasible. What's the word? Unfeasible. Yeah. Yeah. It's not unfeasible that Donald Trump has met some celebrities. No. No. You don't. You don't accept that he's met Neil Young. Yeah, uh, that's a hoax. You're a hoax. 